I do think fitness saved my life. You know, I was a gymnast and a sprinter. I grew up an athlete. I believe that was out of necessity. I think I was fast and strong and I was a great athlete because I had a lot of energy. I have a lot of energy in my system that if it's not released, it comes out as anger or anxiety and frustration. So mm. put your kids into sports. Not only is it the greatest thing they can do to learn about themselves and discipline, but let them move that energy in their, their body. Your kid doesn't have ADHD. It's probably just hyper and they haven't yeah. been moving enough. Kids need to move a lot. Yeah. Movement saved my life. I'm so passionate about exercise and movement because it's it keeps me sane. <laughs> hey guys, it's Mike. Today's episode is with someone I've known for a very, very long time. Her name is Angie, AKA my little sister. In today's episode, we dive into Angie's story and why we started Soul CBD, a wellness company we co-founded four years ago. Ange is one of the most passionate, caring, enthusiastic, and funny people I've ever met. She is constantly making me and the people around her laugh, and I'm sure that's why her own podcast, The Angie Lee Show, has almost 20 million downloads since inception. Needless to say, I'm incredibly proud of her as I've sat in the back of rooms watching her speak on stages all over the country. She has also battled with her own issues of anxiety and ADHD, and we chat about how that pain helped us create soul. So without further ado, here's the self-proclaimed baby grandma herself and my little sister, Angie. Welcome back. We obviously started off, this will be the on air or off air about farting <laughs> and uh, pooping your pants, which is a perfect segue into... <laughs> My little sister Angie and everything she is about as she sits there laughing, probably holding in a fart right now. I can tell by the look on her We're face. We're gonna get so many DMs. We're in a small studio here. <laughs> <laughs> but Angie, I know we we kind of dove into my story and a lot of what I was looking for to get out of this podcast. And I think this is uh, an awesome opportunity to get started and tell people about you yeah. and your story. And the ways that you make people laugh, what makes you tick, and really what you're looking to help and inspire people with in this show as we bring on guests. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think as I think about you right away, the first word that comes to mind is authentic. Mm -hmm. I think that you have always chased <clears throat> what feels authentic to you, and that's a rarity. Um, and I even know since since childhood, like you always were doing things different, whether it was you know, we're putting underwear on our head and like pretending where we have the Mike and Angie show or um, you not going to school or <laughs> listening in school or sp speaking of which, we have a great story. You need to tell the color wheel story, oh, okay? which we'll dive into and might be a great, great way to start off the interview. <laughs> but you kind of took the road less traveled. Yeah. And I always admired you for that. And I think that you listen to your heart and you're authentic, but um, I'd be great for them to kind of hear a little bit about like your childhood and you, and, um, I'll insert funny joke that you probably don't want me to tell here. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, that's actually a great story. Why don't you, why don't you tell people listening about <laughs> you as a kid and the color wheel story? Oh man. So like Mike said, my, my greatest passion and, and gift is inspiring people to be them. And I know that's the cheesiest thing, but nothing makes me happier than, when people are around me and they'll say, I don't know why I just wanted to tell you this, or I've never told anyone this, but I just feel comfortable telling you this, or you make me just want to be weird and unexpressed and, and wild. And I call it owning your weird, which essentially means owning what makes you you. And I think if we all did that, Stephen Pressfield talks about this in his books and uh, as a creative and as just a human being, if we all actually expressed who we were, we would all be happy. He actually believes there wouldn't be any disease. There wouldn't be a lot of illness if people were actually creating the art they were meant to create. Now, when I say the word art, I don't necessarily mean painting. It could be dance, movement, expression, whatever is art for humans. We all are creating art in some aspect. Every single conversation is art. Everything is art, right? And so he believes a human fully expressed is a human that's healed and is happy. And all of us are just holding in stuff. So we're not. So I do feel like that's kind of my biggest thing is, is seeing people be weird and wild and not follow the rules and and uh, create the life that they want. Because I think we're living in a simulation in a sense, right? Not to get too weird, but this is a game. And I think it's meant to be played. And from a really young age, I felt that way about life. I, I realized the rules that I, that I needed to follow, such as being a good person and being kind and all of those good rules. But something I picked up probably from one of our parents is there are certain rules you don't need to follow and you should actually create your own. 
And so one of them was uh, I didn't go to school a lot because I, I, I think, not I think, I know struggling with ADD and ADHD and if you're listening and you have it or you have a child who has it, this will resonate with you. You always feel like there's something wrong with you. Having a neurodivergent brain or a neurodiverse brain, you constantly feel like you're taking in information differently. You're overstimulated a lot, so you get overwhelmed easily. And you feel like you're, uh, I always explain it as half of me feels like I have an unfair advantage because I'm extremely creative and I think outside the box. And the other half feels like it's just unfair. It's unfair that the other kids were able to finish tests and sit down for eight hours a day in school. And I wasn't because I was hyper and wanted to move and and play. And so school was always extremely difficult for me. I mean, I remember coming home from the bus stop, eight years old, telling mom to take me out of jail. <laughs> right. I said jail. She was like, all right, that's a, that's a strong word. But I just never wanted to be there. I liked the social aspect, but I just, I didn't want to do the same thing every single day, eight hours a day, responding to a bell. Recess isn't, isn't long enough. That's a different episode for a different day, but the entire school system is not conducive to the super creative kid. It's not super conducive to most children and how they work. It, it's it's not right. And that's why a lot of kids have behavior issues. Mm -hmm. They don't have behavior issues. There's, they're an eight-year-old. They want to lick a tree and then paint something purple that they shouldn't and run in circles. And right, that's, that's what being a kid's about is being unexpressed and unhinged. And so being so unhinged, it was difficult to get me to go to class and study and take tests. And art was one of them that I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm out. So I decided one day that I was going to uh... <laughs> just jump in. I was in my art class in uh, middle school and my friend was like, dude, your assignment is due today. And I was like, what assignment? Shit. And usually I, I like cheated or asked the kid next to me like, hey, do you have the do you have the homework or do you have the work? And they all were like, no, we already turned him in. So I was like, shit, what am I going to do? So I went into the hallway to pretend I had to go to the bathroom. And in the hallway was all the previous class that already turned their, them in. It was all of them in. Uh, on the wall for display so I was like well I'm just gonna grab one really quick and put my name on it like this, this is gonna this is gonna go really well so I grab one and I real quick put my name on the back without really looking and turn it in when she's not looking I put it in the pile like in the middle so it's like ooh, I turned it in yeah. on time you know <clears throat> and then all of a sudden the next day uh, I get a call from the print from the principal's office they're like you need to come to the principal's <laughs> office and I'm like what the fuck and I go there and he sits me down and he's like do you know what you did yesterday in our <laughs> class? And I was like, I was like, no, sir. Like, what did I do? He's like, you took the teacher's example and turned it <laughs> as your own. <laughs> it was the teachers. Not only did I not steal another kid. No, no, no. I didn't steal another kid. I stole the teachers. I didn't see that her name was on it because I'm a little dipshit. And so I turned it in all confident. Like, it looked so good. Of course it looked good. It was the teachers. It was perfect. It was a color wheel. Like, give me a break, right? I don't need to practice Roy G. Biv. So... I remember they called mom and they were like, listen, your daughter cheated. Like she's, you know, this isn't good. Mom was like, whatever. It's it's fine. It's a color wheel. So <laughs> <laughs> Mike and my mom love that story because that that's me in a nutshell. I trying just, to trying to <laughs> make it happen. And <laughs> it's a I, shit show. I just would have loved to see the teacher's uh, face while she was like going through. OK, here's Susie's. <laughs> here's Adam's. Oh, my God. <laughs> This is Angie mine. wrote her name on like <laughs> just like shameless. Yeah. Like I, like that's how I would I'm shameless. Right. <laughs> but you somehow got through school and I remember you graduated high school um yeah. and then went to college. I know within that you were thinking about journalism mm -hmm. but then thought about going uh becoming a dietitian mm -hmm. and <clears throat> working in the hospital system. But you obviously changed your mind with that and eventually dropped out of college, which at times is scary considering your whole family and everybody in society is telling you to do this. Uh, what was your thought process there and, and what, what happened with that? Yeah. And this was 2013, 12. So it wasn't as trendy then as it is now. It, it wasn't as acceptable. Now I think entrepreneurship and working for yourself in some capacity is is getting uh, – the, the the light, you know, it, it's seen as a really sexy, admirable thing to do. Uh, but back then it wasn't, it was, you know, uh, social media wasn't what it was today. There was blogs and, and there was obviously the internet, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, what it is now as far as like commerce and connection and, and what's possible. And so, you know, especially in 2009 to 2013, to be telling people that 
you have, you have a blog and you want to see if you can build an online audience and make money doing that. People thought you were crazy. And I remember being in my dietetics class and I was failing. I was failing anatomy, of course. I mean, if anybody's taking anatomy, it's so cool, but it's so hard. It's not just like, oh, label the heart, label the wrists, label the penis. No, it's not like that. It's like really difficult. It's like this vein goes into this vein and, th and you're like, oh my God, it's so difficult. And so I'm failing anatomy. And uh, I asked the girl next to me, I'm like, what are you planning to do with this degree? She was like, well, I'm going to go be a dietitian in a hospital. And I was like, how much do you think they get paid? Like, and how much do you think they work? And she told me roughly what she said they get paid and how much they work. And I said, I'm out. <laughs> I was like, this doesn't make sense. Like, I can't do this. And so, yeah, I remember walking into uh, my counselor's office. I was $100,000 in debt uh, at, from school. So financially, I wasn't doing super well. I was a personal trainer. I was making random money here and there randomly would make some money online from an ebook sale or a coaching client. So it was kind of like I was just scrapping together, doing random things just to get by and to start slowly paying off this debt. And uh, I walked into her office and I said, you know, I really want to give this spot to somebody else because there's only so many spots in the dietetics school. And I was like, another girl deserves to be in this. Like, why am I here? I don't want to be here. I would be in chemistry class literally during a test. And I remember responding to people on Facebook and on my blog, like, when I was posting little fitness tips, like drink this smoothie, do these push-ups, you know, do more burpees, hardcore fitness. And I was more obsessed with responding to them and creating a community and seeing what this could become. Even though I didn't know what it was, I had this feeling it could become something. I wanted that more than I wanted the, the certainty of going to get a safe job. It just, nothing felt safe to me. So I was like, I might as well do this. And when you're 22 years old, you don't care, right? You're kind of like, whatever, who cares? I'm in debt. Who cares? I don't have kids. I don't have a family. I don't, it doesn't really matter. And so I walked in and told her that uh, I was leaving. And she was like, okay, I'm going to give you 48 hours to think about this. So here's the packet. You have to sign the bottom. Just sit and sit with it a little bit. You know, you worked really hard. I mean, I was like, I had done so much school. I'd already gone to college for like three years at that point. And she was like, if you're sure, I just want you to think about it a bit. And I remember I just grabbed the paper and just <laughs> mm -hmm. didn't even think about yeah. it and just signed it and walked out. And I remember that that elevator ride was one of the best of my life, just pressing the button going down because that was the first time since I was a kid that I didn't have homework due tomorrow and I didn't have to go to class. And I felt so free. And I remember that moment being like, holy shit, now it gets real. I don't, I don't have a job. I don't go to school. What do I do? And that's when I became obsessed with, let me figure out how to monetize on the internet. Let me figure out eBooks and coaching and events. And let me study this and figure this out because I think this could work for me and my personality type more than going to a traditional job. So I was hungry. I was willing to just figure it out and figure out whatever I could to not go to corporate because I was so unemployable. And uh, yeah, I remember she looked at me like I was crazy. She was like, what are you going to go do? Most people, you know, most people who don't have a college degree are not going to be successful. Like most people who don't she finish this. Yeah. She yeah. was basically really concerned. She was like, I really yeah. want you to think about this. She was my guidance counselor. So of course she's, her job is to have me finish. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I have a feeling that whatever it is, it's not going to require a resume. So I'm, I'm going to go figure this out. And I left and it was, that was the moment that started everything with building my wellness brand and then teaching online marketing. And then now transitioning more into just lifestyle content, full-time influencer, entrepreneur, events, podcasting, speaking on stages. It all started from that one day of me being like, fuck it. I don't want to do school. I want to figure this out. And uh, it's been, what, 13 years now that I haven't had a regular job. <laughs> 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 I haven't, which is pretty cool. But also the first few years of that are scary. You know, you're not making a lot. It wasn't until years in that I was actually making good money from, from my brand. And I'm honest about that. A lot of people interview me about brand building. And uh, it's a lot of consistency. It's a lot of vulnerability. It's a lot of being committed to the long-term vision of what it could be. And, and I'm so grateful I did. I'm so grateful that the 19 year old version of me said, let me try this instead, because now I have an asset that I've built for the last 13 years, mm -hmm. which is an audience, which now is a really smart asset in, in today's day and age that I can utilize in many different ways, courses, physical products, digital products, speaking. I can, I can play with that all because I decided that, I mean, there were years where I created content every single day. I remember I would run home from cl class and film a quick video or make a post or post a little recipe. I mean, I was just obsessed with like, if I just post every single day, it has to work. If I just keep creating interesting content, it has to work. And it did. And so <clears throat> now I have more life balance with it. But in the beginning, I definitely created a lot of content. I was like a machine. <laughs> yeah. No, so. And fast forward, you know, whatever, eight, eight years later, and you're hosting an event in San Diego called Pays Be Brave. Yeah. And you had, you know, 
over two, I think it was 3,000 women there, and you're on stage at this huge production. People flew in from all over the country and world to come see you speak and come feel inspired and learn about marketing. And it's kind of crazy as you look at that moment in the elevator to that point. I know you threw your first event in Chicago, and I don't know how many people showed up on that one. Yeah. What was that like? Well, my first few events – Really Work, nobody workout, workout events. Yeah. Like, okay. I would do these fitness empowerment events. And the first few only had a few girls. I would, I would have my clients meet me in the park, my personal training clients, and then they would bring a, bring a friend. So my first one was three people and then it was five and then it was 10 and then it was 15 and mom would be at one. So it was like, you know, another eight people and, and it didn't make me a dollar, but there was something in me telling me that you're really good at bringing people together. I love creating community and culture and and uh, a sense of camaraderie and, and I love putting on parties. So I was like, you know what, this, this is, this is something I really want to get into. And I love people telling people that. Cause a lot of women ask me, how do I host events? How do I do that? And they don't see me in the park with three girls, just let's do burpees. Let's talk about life, you know, and motivating them. All they see is the sexy highlight reel of, of pays be brave, which took a lot of money and time and resource to put on. But yeah, in the beginning, it was just me meeting up with girls in Chicago. And then that first one with a hundred girls was really fun because I remember it was the first big one. And I, <clears throat> didn't have enough money to rent out the space because it was a lot. The guy wanted a few grand and I didn't have that. So I asked him if I could trade and train some of my clients there in exchange for his space in his backyard. Cause he had mm. this really cool backyard attached to the gym. And so, uh, I had some of my friends help me with the goodie bags and got my DJ on Craigslist. I think I paid him in some Chicago deep dish pizza and my overhead was pretty cheap then. And I put it on and still didn't make me a dollar, but I remember immediately looking into that crowd of those 100 women. And for me, 100 was a lot of people. And that still is. To get 100 people in the room is a, is a lot of people. And I just remember being like, this is a shit. This is, I want to keep doing this. This is fun. So I, I've never really had the answer. And, and you and you really nailed it, Mike, with like, um, I just keep following the next thing that feels really exciting. And I know that's so cheesy to say, but I follow the, the butterflies. I follow the fire. I follow the thing that's uh, that is telling me like, that would be fun to try out. Let me see if that feels good. And then in that, I can kind of play and see if that is something that I'm good at or I suck at and if I want to keep with it. And so I'm not afraid to try new things. And that's really been my, even now pivoting into like, okay, what's next? I have this show. And then, and what will my brand become over the next few years? I think I'm trying to always remind myself to just uh, embrace the pivot and just follow the next thing that excites you. Because mm -hmm. when I do, when I'm excited about it, it always works out. It always works out well. And then you started your show, The Angie Lee Show. I remember yeah. when you first called me up about <clears throat> starting the podcast. And I was like, what's a podcast, first of all? What are you doing? Go get a real job. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And it really started taking off. And so many millions of downloads later, what do you feel like people are, why are they listening to you? Like, what do you, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> what? Why they're crazy? Why yeah, are they but... listening to you? Yeah. Wh why do you feel like you know? Because most of your audience is women. What do you feel like as they turn on their show, your show? What are they looking for? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny too because now sitting here, this is a, a crazy full circle moment. Because when I wanted to start my podcast, I wasn't techie at all. I'm still not techie, and I like reminding the women and the men listening that you don't have to have all the answers to figure it out. You can hire and get help with the things that you don't know how to do. And uh, I knew this one kid I went to high school with was an audio engineer. So I DM'd him on Instagram and I said, I want to start a podcast. Have you heard of this yet? And he said, yeah, I know how to upload one to Libsyn and I, I know how to do it. And I was so overwhelmed. I'm like, how do you record an audio file and how do you upload it to a hosting site? And how does it talk to iTunes? And I was so overwhelmed. So I said, can I come over or you come over and I pay you just to like show me how to set it up and do it? Because I know if you show me in person, I could do it. And I remember I went over to his house. It was a snowy day in Chicago. I took the train and I got my little backpack and I walked in and I was like, okay, so what do I plug into where? And and I was so overwhelmed. And I just remember being like, okay, I'll figure this out. So I paid some random kid to show me how to set all this up and do it. And uh, from there, it, it kind of grew. But I, I think, not I think, but what really has been the, the, the biggest thing for me is a few things. One, obviously, the vulnerability of sharing what it's been like, uh, not only with ADHD, but dropping out of college and uh, sharing that journey with my audience of how to put yourself out there, how to build a brand. But I've tried to do my best at staying extremely true to me and, and, and very vulnerable. And I don't follow a lot of women in my similar space, especially when I was in the health space and then the marketing space. I actually tuned out a lot of the noise. And I think that's what allowed me to, to stand out in a sense and would get people to say, hey, you, you sound different. There's something about you that's just different. And I noticed that's for me putting the blinders on, which I think for anybody who's a creative, it's really important 
Uh, a lot of authors don't read a lot of other books in their genre. That's really smart because eventually you just you start to become regurgitated. And mm -hmm. so uh, I like to tune out the noise a lot and and say what's true for me and share that experience. So yeah, it's been it's been it's been a fun ride. It's a it's definitely a medium that I mean the listeners know right now. You can build a lot of intimacy with people being in yeah. their ears. Which part of all this do you feel most excited about? I know there's seasons for everything, yeah. but we talk about building soul. We talk about your podcast, um, the live events, the yeah. coaching, the wellness tips, the comedy, what, which mm. part kind of lights you up in this next season? Yeah, it's a, uh, I feel like who I am even now at 32 is so different, not so different, but is more evolved and grounded than even 27, 28. And I would say the things that are the top of mind that are the most exciting to me are one, obviously the show with you, uh, seeing soul grow up, it's almost like watching a kid grow up. It's just so cool because it was just a little idea. And we were sitting around the bonfire with our team the other night. And I just looked around and I was like, what? You know, it, mm -hmm. it's like those moments where you're actually taking in the moment that you mm -hmm. knew you'd look forward to one day. You're like, this is it. Oh, this is what we wanted. We wanted to have a team one day. We wanted to have cool retreats. Like, this is it. We're in the it. And so sometimes I do that just to take in life. Mm. And I was like, this is pretty cool. We actually have employees now. <laughs> and this was just an idea, you know? So that's really exciting to watch that grow, that there's something so cool about an idea coming to fruition. Um, I would like to possibly get back into events, maybe in a different way. Um, comedy content absolutely sets my soul on fire. I love script writing. I love making people laugh, obviously. And I really want to keep making funny short video clips. I love being different characters and maybe play around with stand up for fun on the weekends or who knows. Um, and then, yeah, I want to, I want the next evolution in my, you know, my thirties will be obviously becoming a mom. And I, I want to show women both. I think there's only so many women. I know for men it's different, obviously, but there's only show, so many women showing um, both being done well of, Hey, I'm ambitious. I'm creative and I have a family and I love all of it. And I, with help, <laughs> right? Because that's that's the context here. With help, I, I I don't believe you have to give up one for the other. And I do think there are some women showing that. And I, that's very inspiring to me, mm -hmm. that they're ambitious and they're creative. And and they also have kids. And, and they show that they, they love it all in different ways. And one is not better than the other. And they're just, one is an expression of self, of purpose. One is building a family. And, and I don't want to give up one for the other. And I want to be able to show women both. So I think that's my goal in life. My goal would be to create a brand that women look at and think, wow, she has somehow figured out with help. <laughs> I like to put that because I think women listening will be like, dude, it takes, you know, nannies and help. But uh, with help has figured out how to kind of do it all, even though there's different seasons to everything. But because I, I do want it all. I'm someone who I, I see myself as uh, I have very traditional values and that I want to have be an awesome, badass, cool, fun mom. And I also want to have a really fun career and express that passion and amb ambition. And I think there's this bullshit story out there that you have to choose. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's not how it has to be anymore. So I think that's like the new will become the new version of me whenever that yeah. happens. So I mean, <laughs> that's the tattoo is the and sign. Oh right, I the, know. What do you call it? The ampersand. It's an ampersand. Yeah, yeah, that's so crazy. Ampersand. You reminded me of that I forgot. I actually have the and sign tattooed to me because I feel like being so multi passionate and being multi dimensional, which we all are. I've always desired both, and I've always looked up to both, and thought, wow, how cool would it be to create a life where I get to know what both of those feel like. So I don't have to choose one and that's what I have to be for the rest of my life. So now I've been looking up to women who are doing both really well. And, and, and I look to them for inspiration and, and like, wow, how are you doing that? And what's the reality of that? And so that's been really cool. And uh, I think that's healthy to talk to about women. Cause I think a lot of women feel like, do I have to choose one? Is it like I become a mom and I'm frumpy and my life's over, or, you know, or do I have to have only a career and, you know, be this hashtag boss babe and wake up when I'm 15 and be like, oh shoot, I forgot to do that. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting to be a woman in business because I think it's your desires to balance it all are a little different than men. Maybe you're. Yeah. Well, I mean, and on top of seasons. that, <laughs> on top of that, we talked about like ADHD and the squirrel, so. squirrel brain, you know, something that you definitely deal with. It's like <laughs> hurting squirrels. It's like trying to get one idea down and see it all the way through. Yeah. And that's just kind of your brain. It's definitely not my brain. I think we equal each other out really <clears throat> well on that in terms of, you know, owning and running a business. But um, and I'd love to get some doctors and wellness experts on the show coming up about ADHD, oh, right? Yeah. Because so many more people, and especially kids that are be, being put on Adderall <clears throat> and Ritalin, it's become so much more prevalent in today's society. Mm -hmm. But coming from me, I don't, I can't empathize on what's what that's like. What yeah. what is that like for you? And what what have you used? What type of tools have you used to help combat that? 
Yeah, absolutely. And and it's something that uh, it's the m- one of the most downloaded episodes on mine for a reason. And I was nervous to share it at first. And now I realize it's it's by far the biggest question in my inbox is my kid has it or I have it or talk about it more. So I would I would love for us to do that because it is a hot, hot topic. I see it as something that you constantly have to figure out how to navigate naturally because I've chosen the natural route. Uh, I think Adderall has its time and place, but I think it's kind of like legalized crack. And eventually you kind of feel like shit when you're not on it. That's been the experience for most people. So I just, Mm -hmm. I've, I've decided, Hey, let's see if I can first figure this out naturally. I'm obviously very diligent about movement and nutrition, having a low sugar diet and moving my body a lot has helps me tremendously. If Mm -hmm. those two foundational things and my sleep is huge. If I'm not sleeping well, having too much sugar and I'm not moving my body, I have so much built up energy and anxiety in me that I feel like I have to punch something (laughs) you know it just feels like anxiety sitting in a little like a boiling plate and so something I've learned is that people with ADHD our prefrontal cortex is not releasing the same amount of dopamine so I actually am craving more dopamine so usually you'll see people with a neurodiverse brain aka ADHD we crave newness we crave novelty a lot of people with ADHD want to jump out of planes. I do not. I crave it in my physical space. I want to repaint a room. I want to get new furniture. I want to move to a new house. You've seen me change a lot of yeah, things. Yeah, I remember in my growing life. up, you would change that <laughs> your room like every two weeks. You would completely yep. move around like your bed and your little desk, <laughs> and it was just constantly changing. Isn't yeah. that crazy? It's a yeah. it's a telltale sign. Mom would come home and say like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I just needed a new, fresh energy," and it would make me feel like this new person. And I just love, I love novelty. I love trying new things, and so. For me, I've asked myself, how can I do that in healthy ways? Okay, is it just changing up my environment? Is it going on a vacation? Is it what is it that can make me feel that that healthy sense of dopamine? Movement. Movement is one of the best ways to get dopamine. We know that. Hit exercise. So if I want to be productive, I have to work out that morning. I have to get my blood flowing and then go right into work. Some structure. You know, I need integrators and supporters in my life. I see it as like a a bowling ball going down the the aisle without the bumpers. I need bumpers and it's not a weakness. It's I need bumpers to stay in, in line. I do well actually with a little bit of structure so my creativity can thrive inside that structure. I've noticed as I'm getting older, I've learned. So I've become way more organized lately, which is crazy for me. I like everything in you know, Google, Slack. I like everything more organized so that my creativity can flourish. But it took me over 30 years to figure out that I need that. And then nootropics, we'll get into episodes on that. But I play with a lot of different, herbal remedies and nootropics to see what will work. I took something today called Dopa Plus, Beekeepers Naturals, our alert caps. I've tried many different modalities as far as low carb, high protein, low fat, high fat to see what will be the best for my brain. Uh, Last thing, because we don't have to keep this whole episode on ADHD, but stabilizing blood sugar is huge. Mm. It is huge for mental clarity. If I do a lot of carbs, let's say a huge bowl of brown rice, pasta even though it's gluten free i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to get a crash after that and i'm going to feel a little irritable and i'm not going to be able to focus so a very high protein diet has worked extremely well for me i eat a lot of healthy protein a lot of healthy meats to stabilize the blood sugar and to have focus so i'm constantly doing a bunch of things whether it's my external environment hiring helpers to keep me organized my my diet movement exercise to to stay i'm constantly doing those things in order to yeah to to uh, use it as my advantage and I do think fitness saved my life. You know, I was a gymnast and a sprinter. I grew up an athlete. And I, I feel like I stopped being an athlete when you really got into it. Mm-hmm. I believe that was out of necessity. I think I was fast and strong and I was a great athlete because I had a lot of energy. I have a lot of energy in my system that if it's not released, it comes out as anger or anxiety and frustration. So mm-hmm. I think that athletics is, for all the moms listening or, or dads, put your kids into sports. Not only is it the greatest thing they can do to learn about themselves and discipline, but man, let them move that energy in their their body. Your kid doesn't have ADHD. It's probably just hyper and they haven't been moving enough. Kids need to move a lot. Movement saved my life. I'm so passionate about exercise and movement because it's, it, keeps me sane, <laughs> you know? So plus the standard American diet right now is really, really terrible. Um, so bad. I think very high in carbs and sugars. It's interesting. You said that because last night we were just talking about that you did carnivore diet, I think for yeah, 30 days, weeks. maybe, or a few weeks. Yeah. How did you notice? Cause that's obviously extremely high protein, fat, uh, yeah. no carbs. Yeah. So you're essentially getting into ketosis. Yeah. How did you notice getting into ketosis yeah. and, and that affecting your ADHD? Yeah. It worked really, really well for me. And it's interesting because they have shown that the two situations where they feel that carnivore or ketosis work really well is one, obviously like autoimmune and illnesses just to reset the body, but also uh, seizures and then ADHD. So Dr. Raymond, who we've interviewed before together, Mm -hmm. 
he talks a lot about this. And when I got my brain scan back, Mike and I went to the Dr. Daniel Amen Clinic in Orange County and we got our test back. Immediately, I get on the Zoom and the guy said, your creative centers of your brain are, are very well lit. So you, I can tell you're probably entrepreneurial and creative. And I said, yeah. And he said, but you are classic type one ADHD. You, you, if you aren't interested in something, literally, <laughs> he showed that the front of my brain just turns off. But when it is interested in something, there's dopamine, aka and for anybody listening who doesn't know what dopamine is, it's the receptor that, you know, the pleasure receptor. When you're excited about something, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so fun or exciting. It it goes off like crazy. So we are people who, when we do love something, we are fucking unstoppable. It's called hyperfocus. That's one of our strengths. We are just in it. We're in a t in a tube. We're in the zone. We're like, let's go. I'll do it. But we have to figure out what that is. So I also am really big on the parents listening or you listening. If you have this. You have to do what you love, not because it's cute to say on a little Pinterest quote and do what you love, because you will be so good at it if you love it. But if you don't, you cannot, you, you're not going to show up, right? And that's yeah. true for all of us. Even the neurotypical like you should absolutely do what you love, but even more so, you got to find what you love. And you'll notice in people who are ADHD or on the spectrum of autism or whatever, they have usually like some few things they're really, really good at, you know, on the, on the show, sure. on the spectrum. It's such a beautiful show they'll know like all the dinosaurs. And you're like, holy shit, how does he so good at that? It's just like we find the thing that we're obsessed with and we're just like, this is it. We love being obsessed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning how to harness that. Like, okay, find the few obsessions, go all in on those versus thinking I have to do like, you know, the shit I'm not good at or don't want to do. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard. School was hard. But now I feel like um, in this creative job, it's it's been better, but I'm constantly working on it. I'm constantly trying to figure out how to be better. And at 32, I'm finally now taking it very seriously on how to be more organized and <laughs> control the squirrels. Yeah. I, I think being obsessed and loving what you do is, is massive too. And so much easier said than done, but I know at least in, in sports that really separated <clears throat> a lot of athletes that I saw, yeah. um, guys who have physical talent that could only take them so far, but if they're obsessed, do you see guys like the greats, like Michael Jordan, last dance on yeah. Netflix obviously shows that when you become obsessed you're willing to do things others aren't and so i think trying to find a find a zone of genius there and hone in on that it's amazing but what's interesting is you can fall in and out of obsession yeah. right i know for me that was boxing i know yeah. you you were a state gymnast like yeah. a hell of an athlete and then all of a sudden you hated it and you didn't want to do it so yeah. it's also like kind of understanding you can fall in and out of these seasons too but yeah. i forgot why why you quit gymnastics? I got hurt what... a lot. Yeah. Not hurt, okay. hurt, but my elbow. I remember I uh, fractured my elbow. And, you know, it's interesting, our stories with athletics, because yours was later in life. And so there's a part of you that feels like you missed your 20s. But there's a part of me that feels like uh, I missed some of that normal childhood a little bit with going to so many competitions. And me and mom would be driving to Wisconsin on the weekends, and I'd be staying with her in hotels and I trained 40 to 50 hours a week. That's a full-time job for a little yeah. girl. I was ripped. I mean, I was training so hardcore. And I remember missing most of fourth grade for gymnastics. Mom wrote so many notes to get me out to the point where they were like, you've missed more than what's acceptable. She basically missed fourth grade. So I always joke that the reason I'm not good at certain things with history or math is I'm like, I was that in fourth grade. I don't remember. I was doing flip flops or flip, uh, ju you know, jumps. So it's, it's interesting because, um, yeah, I think that for me, I feel like I missed, I think that's what was happening is I came home one day and I said to mom, I just want to, I just want to go to a birthday party with the other girls and eat cake. I just want to be like a normal kid. And I was training so hardcore. I wanted to be an Olympian. I made it to level nine. It goes level nine, level 10 elite. And then you start training for the Olympic trials. I mean, mm -hmm. who knows? Not saying everybody makes it then it gets really hard at level 10 and elite, but that was my goal and my vision at the time. I was like, I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, you know, so when you're a little kid and that's all you want, you think that's okay. But then you wake up and you're like, shit, the other kids get to go to birthday parties. So <laughs> I think I was just young started when I was three. So it's crazy that that's kind of the culture of gymnastics. It's it intense. feels way too intense, way too early to where you got young girls and, and guys that are in it at such young age. Cause you turn on the TV and you see Olympians that are gymnasts. They're what? 16 years old. They're little girls. Like if you're 20, you're over the hill. Yeah. So in order to get that good by 15 and 16, like you have to start at five and yeah. it has to be obsessed. And at five years old, who, who knows what they want to do? Like know. who, who know? Like, and so it, you either love it or your parents tell you love it, but yeah, that's, yeah. I really see that as kind of a, a damaging thing. I, I think that it's so much healthier for kids to be playing a million different sports mm. growing up. Right. 
Yeah, that's a and, good point. And be and even some of the greatest athletes in the world um, kind of grew up that way. They were more well-rounded playing a lot of different yeah. sports and then finally honing in on something that you love and not that you're pushed into. You know? Yeah, and I think we both grew up with both parents, but, but you know, dad especially who was wanting us to really – excel at things. And so I think that mentality of like, wow, she's exceptional at this. And I was similar to how you with boxing, you were competing uh, with the older guys. I was, you know, years ahead of the girls who were my age. So I was strong. I was fast. I was flipping around and doing backflips on beams. When I was eight years old, I was doing backflips on a little tiny beam, which now would freak the shit out of me. But I was doing that. And so of course, when you're good, they think, well, this has got to be her thing. And so then they push you into it. And then next thing you know, the minute I'm done with school. I'm not going to the after school parties and things. I'm getting in the car. Mom's handing me, you know, macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets, shoving it down so I can get to practice and train all the way until 8, 9 p.m., come home exhausted, try to do some homework. I mean, my a lot of what I remember was training a lot and physically on my body. Um, but I don't regret that. I think it was uh, great. It taught me so much strength and discipline. And, oh, man, I would I would love to put if I have daughters in, into gymnastics. But, yeah, there there is a weird mentality to it. The coaches are very intense to mm -hmm. very young girls. Yeah. It's not like, how are you feeling? How are you doing? No, it's like get back on the beam, do another flip. And you're shaking and you're scared and you're crying. Do another flip. And you're like, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. Let's go. Like it's 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 kind of like hardcore, which isn't really healthy <laughs> for an eight year old girl to. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, be it's, going through, but it's not. I mean, it's good. It teaches that, you some discipline. It, yeah, exactly. It's good that you're learning discipline and you're learning life skills, but yeah. um, ultimately, it's probably too much. Hey guys, what's up? It's Mike. I'm popping in here to tell you about my absolute favorite soul product, our Alert Focus Caps. If you're dealing with any morning fatigue, brain fog, or just relying on coffee throughout the day to get you by, I got you. This is a doctor formulated product that's been proven to increase focus, energy, and concentration with our proprietary blend of a handful of adaptogens, nootropics, and plant extracts. Some of the ingredients we use are lion's mane, mushrooms with neuroprotective effects that reduce brain fog and improve memory. We've got B12 in there, a brain boosting vitamin that can improve mental clarity, increase energy, and boost mood. We've got all natural caffeine from green tea extract with CBD to stop any jitters. And finally, one of my favorites, we've got a phenomenal blend of cordyceps in there. This is a powerhouse mushroom that's gaining popularity day over day because it increases oxygen uptake in the brain and increases blood flow to the brain, which will help you fight mental fatigue. You're going to feel alert and dialed in without the jitters. I promise you got to go try this out and exclusive to our best medicine podcast listeners we're offering a 20 percent off code on alert and all sold products so just use code tbm and make sure to let us know what you think we've got over six thousand five star reviews now and i'm so proud and i stand by the quality and efficacy of our products so go use code tbm at mysoulcbd.com and enjoy when did you start to feel like the anxiety were, were you feeling anxiety when's the first time you remember experiencing anxiety because i know it's something we talk about a lot and why we started soul and obviously cbd helping people with anxiety and <clears throat> why you became drawn to it but can you remember the first time you experienced that yeah i think uh anxiety for me started when i quit college uh this feeling of being free but also like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? What if this doesn't work out? The sense of I have to figure this out. So I think that's when it slowly started. I didn't have my first full-blown anxiety attack uh, until years later. I think I was about 25, 26. But yeah, that's 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 when it started is feeling mm -hmm. like, what am I going to do? And uh, wanting to prove myself, right? A lot of our stories are similar but different, but wanting to prove that I could make money, wanting to prove that I could be somebody or do something. And some of that's healthy and some of that's not. And I think that's what anxiety is. It's like this undercurrent of, of, um, it almost feels like it's, uh, the sense of you have to keep up, you got to keep doing mm. more. And so I think a lot of that now I'm in a healthier place where I feel like I do things and want to create things out of a, a healthier mindset of a place of helping the world and being creative, not because I need anybody to know that I'm anything or be anything to parents or anything, which is a really good place to be. So then the anxiety goes down. <laughs> what else do you feel like helps you now as an adult with anxiety? Hmm. 
honestly, uh, I'm actually, ironically, I feel like you're more extroverted than me. You, you find a lot of energy being around people. Mm -hmm. You love being around people and then it invigorates you. I think I'm actually an outgoing introvert. So what I have found has helped my anxiety is going inward more and spending more time alone, even if it's just a drive in the car or a workout class or a walk or whatever that is. I need at least an hour a day of, of me organizing and uh, having my own thoughts versus constantly being stimulated with music or sound or talking to someone or creating something or outputting energy. I'm very responsive. So I'm either t answering my community or creating content or I'm with a friend. I'm very outputting. And so I realized that was causing me a lot of anxiety. So now I think doing, uh, having more time alone has been really helpful for me. So whether mm. that's a mini meditation I'll listen to, um, like even before this, I just went outside for five minutes and I just collected my thoughts and got in my body and just pulled it together for a second. Mm -hmm. And that's really good for my ADD too. Instead of letting all the stimulation, the sound and the people here and it gets to be a lot for me. So I just have to have a second where I'm like, this sounds cheesy, but I have to touch the ground and literally just be like, you're here. You're good. Like you got this, you're calm, you're safe, you're in your body. And then I can go into social situations or, or perform or speak on stage or get on video, whatever that is. I ground a lot, which has really, really helped my anxiety for anyone struggling. Again, it's going to sound a little kooky, but putting your hand on a tree, literally physically taking your hand and putting it on the ground and just saying, okay, I'm here in this present moment taking a huge breath. This is where breath work comes in. You don't have to do a whole breath work thing, but just taking a second to take a deep breath and okay, then walk into the room or, or then have the conversation. We don't do that though as humans. We're just going and we're just reacting. So I'm working on that a lot now, like just taking a minute to be like, where are you? Not answering the phone, just being with myself. And, and then I show up as a better person when I do that. So I'm realizing I need to at least have some moments alone. So Because anxiety is, is not being in the present moment. Depression is is the past and anxiety is the future, right? Anytime I'm anxious, it's because I'm spiraling about what could possibly happen wrong or what could go wrong instead of just being right here right now in this moment. And so whatever it takes to get you back to this moment, it could be you're listening right now in the car, pulling over the car in a safe space, obviously, or just taking a minute, turning off the car in the silence, putting your hand on your heart. I'm here. I'm here. I'm alive. I'm breathing. Okay. You know, I don't know. I, that's always been really great for me. Yeah. Which is taking a moment. <laughs> I think the grounding's big too. I mean, that's why I fell, <clears throat> that's why I fell in love with surfing. Um, yeah. You're, you're in the water, you're in nature. That's the ultimate grounding. Yeah. I, I think there's so much power to that and you're also present, you know, so anytime you're getting outside yeah. and, and you're present in that moment, it's massive. And there is something to taking your shoes off and yeah. having your feet on the grass and ground and all that. It's wow. just, I mean, it's tough. Right. It's just tough in today's day and age yeah. to, to make it happen. But when you're out there, you're not thinking about anything else. No, just... it's very similar to boxing with me. It's like the wow. one thing I found that's the only thing actually I found so far to where I'm only thinking about that. I don't bring a cell phone out there. Yeah. I don't bring like an Apple Watch or anything. I'm just in the zone. Wow. And you are controlling what you can control because I can't control the ocean. I can't control the waves, mm -hmm. people around me. I can just control me. And I just kind of sit in that present moment. I think that's something that I, I love because I'm like you. I, I definitely worry about the future a ton. I just always have. <clears throat> and um, that can just bring on so much anxiety as well. Yeah. And it doesn't help anything, right? If you guys have read the book, The Worry Trick, it's a phenomenal book. It's been a really helpful resource for me. He literally breaks down the science of how worrying literally doesn't do anything. So me saying, well, what if we get in the car today and something bad happens and then we, and then salt, this all crashes down or it, it, that doesn't actually, by me over worrying, it didn't help the situation. It so helps he, if you're proactive about it, yes, right? That's it's something it. you can control. If, if it's something that you can control and you're worrying about it, you're like, oh, I'm nervous about the interview. So yeah. I'm going to study more or I'm going to prepare more than for sure. But you're yeah. exactly right. 99% yeah. of worrying there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. Yeah. No, that, that's a great point. That's what I meant is the things we can't control. Like what if this happens today or what if, yeah. And instead of being in the present moment and when you're in the present moment, that's when you can really show up as your highest and as your best. And that's where CBD and, and any calming, uh, calming supplements have really helped. Yeah. So do you have a dream guest? For us? I mean, who knows where this thing takes off, but do you have a dream guest? And Mario Lopez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think your boyfriend's going to love John that. John Stamos. <laughs> uh, 
John St- he's getting <laughs> old now. He's still a hey, good looking he's dude. He's still a though. hottie though. He great had a hair on that he's, one. He's just getting better. He's like fine wine, you know. What is he using Propecia or what do you <laughs> what do you think he's doing there? Today's episode's brought to you. Great about. hair. Um yeah. Ooh. Ooh, that's such a good question. Oh man. Who would be who comes to mind for you? Who comes to mind for me? Yeah. Um wow. You know, wow, you put me on the spot. I have yeah. so many that kind of just ran ran through my head um i love stories as we talked about of people getting knocked down and getting back up mm. um and chris gardner has become a, a a friend of mine he's been to a couple of my fights he is the man that uh pursuit of happiness with will smith was made off of and i love his story and his books it's the ultimate story of um you know getting knocked down and getting back up many many times and the pursuit of happiness one of the greatest movies i've ever seen i mean i, I cry every time i watch it yeah. so i definitely want to get chris on the show i think that's going to be really exciting um in terms of health and wellness i just want to get some good doctors on yeah i think getting you know andrew Huber, huberman on one day yeah. uh, my buddy andy galpin um dr jess petros like all these people that know so much about health and wellness i think is exciting because it's one thing just to kind of have great conversations like this and inspire people but i really want people to come away with okay i'm struggling with um low thyroid or i have low energy like yeah. here's doctor recommended a few good tips like i want some really good takeaways too yeah it doesn't always have to be a doctor to be honest i mean now yeah that's controversial a little bit to say but whatever it's it's bringing on people who maybe they don't have an MD or an ND, but they are ha, have done the work and they have seen uh, in their in their own research like what has actually worked for people. And yeah, I would say Dr. Kelly Brogan just came to mind randomly. Uh, she's phenomenal. She's one of the first people to really speak out about being open-minded to us having these conversations around pharmaceuticals and what they can really do uh, long-term and, and and uh, the whole convers I'm fascinated by the whole conversation around SSRIs and like what it really does and how it has it helped people and how has it actually made some people worse. And I want to have those conversations out in the open because to me, um, seeing loved ones struggle with mental health and just being someone who likes to see people happy, I am obsessed and fascinated with the conversation around mental health and happiness and joy and what makes people depressed and what it, you know, is it, is it biological? Is it hereditary? Is it our nurture versus nature? Like, it's just so fascinating. And she's so good at just breaking down like, like happiness and what, what it really is and the neurotransmitters. And I, I love that conversation. And I think that, uh, she was really bold to be one of the first people to say, Hey, the answer might not be that. So let's just talk about what else it could be. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to bring her on. Cause she's, she's very bold, but, uh, she's great. She's great. So she'd be cool. Who else, you know, <laughs> what about, uh, Heather McMahon? Oh, yeah. Right. Is that her name? <laughs> Comedian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's the best. Yeah. She's she's like the best. Yeah. She'd be funny. We should bring on comedians. Why not? Yeah. Actually, yeah, we should. I want to bring on comedians. Cool. Because we'll they're it. the best. And they they want to talk about mental health a lot too, because a lot of them are messed up. <laughs> yeah. So it makes them so funny. So yeah. <laughs> well, I think we covered literally everything from birth to now. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good. Thank God I came prepared. Um yeah, I, as I said, I'm I'm excited. I'm mm -hmm. super excited to not only dive into your story story more, but um, just hear from all these really awesome guests that we bring on. But is there anything else you want the listeners to know before we get off? You know, no. I think this was a this is a good first first way to kick it off. But yeah, I, I really believe that we need to be having more conversations around holistic health and uh, especially now people are very excited to finally take their health into, into their own hands so mm -hmm. let's do it and i, I want to have brave conversations i want to have stuff that isn't safe i want to go there i want to hear different points of view ones i don't agree with ones i do i want to say things that you're not supposed to but f it let's help people if it helps someone or if it's going to help someone be ha happier or healthier yep let's do it you know and i think that that's what the podcast space needs so i love it this was fun. I was great. Let's uh <laughs> let's wrap this up. Toodles. <laughs> <laughs>